the Gentleman of the Skies, or a supervillain in aviation history, the legend of the skyjacker D.B. Cooper. The FBI was after him, but for decades he was never found and brought to justice. Who was he? What did he want? And did he make it out alive? Here's a rundown of his story. Everything that went down on the eve of Thanksgiving 1971, and the mystery that followed. What went down? Picture this. It's a chilly Thanksgiving in 1971. You're taking Northwest Flight 305 back home to your family from Portland, Oregon, looking forward to some delicious roast in the holiday spirit, expecting nothing more than some in-flight peanuts. Instead, you get the story of a lifetime. Alongside you, a man under the name Dan Cooper purchases a $40 airplane ticket on the same brief 30-minute flight from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. It's a domestic flight, and there are no security checks or even metal detectors. Suited and dapper, Cooper makes his way onto the aircraft with his aviator sunglasses and a briefcase in hand, taking a seat towards the last row, seated in 18E. He gives his drink order to the stewardess, a bourbon, classy. After taking off, things start to get wild. The aircraft is in the air when Cooper hands the stewardess an envelope with an explosive letter inside. It relays a simple message. He acknowledges that he is a bomb and will detonate it if his demands aren't met. The demands are simple. $200,000 in cash, four parachutes, two safety front chutes, and two main back chutes. And no one gets hurt. Roughly $1.2 million in today's currency. At this point, the stewardess hands over the two notes to the pilot, who has relayed the news of the hijacking and his demands to ground control. Things become just a bit panicked on the ground as they're up in the skies. Ground control. FBI, and all relevant authorities are placed on high alert. The flight lands in Seattle, where 36 unsuspecting passengers deplane and have no idea what has taken place and are off-boarded. Two of the stewardesses also deplane, leaving behind three pilots and stewardess Tina Macklow. The ransom money and parachutes are loaded on board, the jet fuel is restocked, and as per D.B. Cooper's demands, the flight is in the air again. The hijacker wants the aircraft to be flown at a low altitude of 10,000 feet, with landing gear down and flaps down. He wants the pilots to fly the aircraft to Mexico City, which isn't possible because there isn't enough fuel on board. Instead, they negotiate and settled on Reno, Nevada. Two F-106 fighter jets and a Lockheed T-33 are shadowing the hijacked flight, but can't fly at such low speed and are forced to circle around the airplane. Cooper orders the remaining stewardess, Tina Macklow, who spent the most time with him, to help him open and lower the aft staircase and then join the pilots in the cockpit. Before she rushes towards the front, she sees him remove the packing card from the parachute rig and then tie something onto himself, most probably the knapsack of money. The Boeing 727 aircraft has a unique feature. With the cabin to himself, he walks onto the air stairs deployed from the back of the fuselage. Then, with the stairway door open, he jumps out of the airplane and skydives to the ground. What happened next has been a mystery for five decades. No amount of reenactments or theories has been able to confirm what exactly happened to D.B. Cooper. Was he just looking for a free trip to Mexico or an entertained ruse? Or was there something even more? The Search This one has had the FBI scratching their heads for years. With his 100% successful hijacking, this one man had single-handedly broken the biggest investigative agency's crime-solving streak. The hunt is still on. They're applying new technologies to scraps of evidence, hoping to finally find a string that ties back to Cooper. Special Agent Larry Carr is taking a new look into the unsolved case, and for the first time in the FBI's history, he's employing everyday citizens to help out. But the first step was gathering everything FBI agents could find. The second the Boeing 727 touched down at Reno, the search was on. The recovered evidence is sparse and can fit into a single box, including eight cigarette butts, a few unused parachutes, and most importantly, a necktie with a tie pin left behind by Cooper. This will be the most critical piece of evidence to date. Besides this, everything from the bag of cash, his homemade bomb, and the two notes he wrote are all gone. The glass he handled for his drink was mixed up with the rest on the flight and could not be traced back. All the items recovered would be deemed useless without finding the suspect himself. 
Since the flight was on autopilot, its flight path was determined and flying Airway Victor 23. Imagine it like this. The airplane is flying on the nationwide highway in the sky. Would it be possible to know the precise moment when Cooper jumped? The cabin depressurized at 8.12 p.m. and the pilots experienced what they describe as pressure bump, similar to ears popping. This key moment could have been the exact moment he jumped out. Additionally, factoring in the height and the strong winds affected the search zone. The fall radius was a whopping 28 miles wide, and the FBI came up empty-handed. The next day, at the chilling crack of dawn near Ariel, Washington, one of the biggest manhunts in U.S. history was initiated. With helicopters and spotter airplanes, a fleet of U.S. officials are on search for the man, the myth, and the hijacker, D.B. Cooper. After weeks of searching in the forest, and just about anywhere they could look, there's no trace of the mysterious hijacker. Being able to finesse a fall from a moving jetliner goes to show that D.B. Cooper was no ordinary average citizen, and most likely had experience in skydiving. The database is full of over a thousand possible suspects, including a woman that are cross-referenced against ex-paratroopers, and there are still no leads. What happens next? The leads are dry. No one in the FBI can say who Cooper was or where he came from. This man was your good old-fashioned supervillain that no one could get their hands on. Out of nowhere, there's a breakthrough. A man under the false name of James Johnson in April 1972 hijacks a Boeing 727, makes the same demands, but this time, asking for a bigger paycheck, jumps out of the aircraft and gets away. A copycat, but not as smart as the D.B. Cooper. Turns out he snitched on himself and boasted to an acquaintance that he could pull off the same feat, but take home a bigger stash of cash. Soon, Richard McCoy Jr. is arrested for the hijacking with a duffel bag of a half million dollars retrieved from his home. He's arrested under suspicion for both hijackings, but is proven not to be Cooper by witnesses. While the FBI didn't find their man, it was now proven to them that D.B. Cooper could have survived the crash and lived on. Until an unsuspecting father and son, Dwayne and Brian Ingram go on a walk along a riverbed. The son digs through the mud only to uncover stacks of cash. Upon double checking, they find that they've hit the jackpot. They've found $5,800 from the original amount. The only issue for the investigation, it's 20 miles away from the expected drop zone. What's even more insane is geologists determined the money was strategically placed in that spot. If the money was not buried by Cooper and washed out of the river a few months after the jump, what could have happened to him? Did he even make it out alive to spend the money he risked his life for? The gentleman thief, the hijacker, wasn't the villain in everyone's story. He's still celebrated and idolized. There's hundreds of works of fiction, from songs, movies, and documentaries that celebrate the feat the unknown hijacker managed to pull off. People have painted conflicting portraits of Cooper, some have called him a chain smoker, a deviant, a criminal, and finally, a gentleman. This is what keeps the mystery and the legend of this story alive. There were over a thousand people of interest. There are few leads. Until one day, private investigator Skip Porteous received a phone call. A man claims to know the identity of D.B. Cooper and suspects it to be his brother. The evidence starts to line up like never before. Kenneth Christensen was a flight attendant for Northwest Airlines at the time of the hijacking. He had grievances about redundancies and layoffs that had occurred around that time. He was also a bourbon drinker and a chain smoker. More boxes to tick. What's even more suspicious is that soon after the hijacking, Christensen buys himself a large house in South Washington, all in cash. But why would a working crew member need to request assistance to lower the air stairs? This seems suspicious, doesn't it? The stewardess, Tina McClough, takes one look at the sketch and says it's the closest match she's ever seen. Yet still, the FBI isn't convinced. With no confirmation or confession, D.B. Cooper is still out there. A new chapter. Under Special Agent Larry Carr, the case is still open. The older evidence is put under a newer microscope in hopes of finally finding D.B. Cooper. For years, the FBI was looking for former paratroopers and people with experience to have been able to pull off the stunt. As the case was reworked, the FBI started to question if they were looking in the right direction. 
D.B. Cooper took extra precautions and boarded with no special equipment. He even chose the worst of the two parachutes provided to him. He could have cut down on weight by specifying the denomination of the ransom money, but chose not to and carried extra weight during his dive. The odds stacked up against Cooper. From minimum equipment, inclement weather including rain and below freezing temperatures, and dressed as a businessman. Even if he landed into the river below him, his splash wouldn't have been gentle. His money bag could also have been ripped open and traveled by water currents at the spot where it was recovered. And yet the question remains, where was the body? DNA confirmed. Modern day technology and analysis equipment is more advanced than half a century ago. Researcher Tom Kay was given direct access to the Cooper evidence by the FBI. In 2008 and 2011, he was given special authorization to analyze the evidence. What was his role and purpose? Kay was looking for DNA to extract, specifically the necktie. He wanted to conduct a series of tests, including vacuuming the tie for microscopic particles. Interestingly enough, he finds more than an expected fingerprint. Metallic titanium particles are retrieved from the tie, an element found to manufacture aircrafts, which at the time wasn't very common and used commercially. Did the FBI's person of interest work at the Boeing factory, headquartered in Portland, Oregon? Kay's research is compacted into one small container. The sterile jar holds a sterile filter inside, which remains unopened. Most importantly, it has DNA inside. Kay agrees to have the NVAC tie sample examined by a credible lab whose specialty is analyzing older forensic cases. A senior analyst from the lab, Samantha Wanzek, shares the results. The cold case reports the sample was not degraded. In fact, a solid profile was retrieved and identified as one male individual. Astonishingly, this is the first time outside of the FBI that D.B. Cooper's full DNA profile exists and the case can be solved. Reluctantly in 2016, the FBI closed the case. But the search for answers hasn't ceased, and resolution is pursued. Eric Ullis, an independent investigator, has been involved in the case for over a decade and identifies as one of the leading D.B. Cooper experts. Ullis wants the DNA profile to be run through the CODIS system, which stands for Combined DNA Index System. This program is ran exclusively by the FBI program for DNA databases. In March 2023, Ulis filed a lawsuit against the FBI in a federal circuit court. Is this internet sleuth the one to crack this unsolved case? Regrettably, he's faced stonewalling from the United States government and received little cooperation. This hasn't stopped Ulis from going to the Capitol and filing an FOIA lawsuit, standing for Freedom of Information Act. He firmly believes the DNA can be examined and use ancestry genealogy to finally solve the case and find the next of kin. Finally, we're led to a forensics lab in Quantico, Virginia, waiting for the FBI to pull a solid DNA profile from evidence discovered, including a single strand of hair left behind on the headrest of the aircraft seat. The databases and resources are available to solve the case. The FBI has not commented on potential litigation. Even decades later, the mystery is as fresh as the day it happened. Today, the living legend is estimated to be in his late 80s or even 90s. Will we ever find out who Dan D.B. Cooper was, or will he remain the shadowy villain of aviation history? We're one step closer than the day he disappeared from radar.